singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Today, my guest is James Barrett. James has created documentary films for National Geographic, the BBC, Discovery Channel, History Channel, and Public Television. In 2000, Barrett interviewed Ray Kurzweil, Rodney Brooks, and Arthur C. Clarke for a film about Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. Most recently, James is the author of a very interesting new book on the technological singularity called Our Final Invention. So welcome to Singularity One-on-One, -on -one, James. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks very much for sending me an advanced uh, reading copy of your book. I, I really, really uh, enjoyed it. Great. I'm glad you liked it. Now, uh, James, before we start our conversation about the meat of the matter, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself in a few words, if possible. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker primarily, but what I've been doing for the last 20 years as a filmmaker is to take uh, sometimes complicated subjects and make them simple. And that's what I have tried to do with Our Final Invention, the book that I've brought out about advanced artificial intelligence. Um, I've tried to put it into, uh, to, into layman's terms. So that's essentially what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. Taking complicated issues and making them simple. Very interesting. I like that a lot. This is kind of what I'm trying to do on my show too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and I can hardly think of any more complex issue than uh, the technological <laughs> singularity. Uh, so how did you get involved into making documentaries? What's the story behind that? Where's the passion? Oh, well, um, even as a kid, I was, uh, I was making, I, I made Super 8 films. And then uh, when I got out of college, I spent, uh, I spent some time traveling um, and I lived in Africa for a number of years and taught school. And then when I came back to the United States, I was writing um, plays and novels that, I, that I, I was having no luck publishing. But I uh, got involved with writing documentaries. And so I came in as a script writer for documentaries. And uh, in fact, it was because of a play I wrote that I got recruited to write in, in documentaries back in the 90s. And... and uh, Fortunately for me, the, the, the people that recruited me were National Geographic, so I started kind of with some pretty good folks. Mm -hmm. And then I, I gradually turned from being a writer into a producer because I think, you know, as you, as you see people take your, your scripts and go out and film them, you become uh, motivated to uh, go out and film them yourself. So in a way, it's fair to say that writing was your first love and then you kind of went into producing after that and therefore... It was a very natural thing for you to go back into writing a book. Yes, yes, I think I think that's a fair, fair thing to say. Mm -hmm. So, so now that writing makes sense, how about the technological singularity? Where does that concept come in your life? Well, about um, it started through documentary. About ten years ago, I was I was making a film about two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey, by Stanley Kubrick. It was actually a collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and uh, science fiction great Arthur C. Clarke. And I, as soon as I, um, as soon as I got that assignment from uh, from Discovery, Discovery Channel, I uh, I thought to myself, Oh my goodness, I'm going to be able to, to interview. Um, I'm going to be able to interview Ray Kurzweil. I'm going to be able to interview Arthur C. Clarke and, and Rodney Brooks because, you know, at the center of the story of 2001 is the HAL 9000, a robot that goes bad. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd been interested in AI for a long time. I'd, been, I'd read a lot about AI. But then to have a chance to interview these three giants. Um, and it was, you know, uh, Rodney Brooks was very positive about what was going to happen with robotics. Uh, Kurzweil was very positive about what would happen when we share the planet with smarter than human intelligence. Um, we went all the way to Sri Lanka to talk to Arthur C. Clarke, and he was not positive at all. He was, he's a very, he was, he's, he's dead now, unfortunately, but he was a very uh, friendly, genial man. But when we got on the subject of artificial intelligence, his mood kind of darkened. Mm -hmm. I, so he was the one negative voice, and that made me start thinking about it. 
So do you think that from the get-go you were kind of uh, influenced by Arthur C. Clarke's powerful negative predisposition? Well, you know, you know, yes, but from the get-go, I was, I was like so many people, really uh, turned on. I, I mean, I'd been following artificial intelligence from from college. Uh, I took some, I had some uh, computing courses. I had a friend who was a really elite programmer. I was fascinated by AI. I was fascinated by the idea that we could create machines that were intelligent, or that were, or even a little bit smart. And uh, even back then, you could see um, you could see some fairly smart machines in, in gameplay. Mostly, I think in gameplay you could see interesting AIs created, and that's gotten mm-hmm. much more so. But I was really, I, and I'm pro AI. I like artificial intelligence. Um, I think I was really turned on to the possibilities by Ray Kurzweil, by his book The Age of Spiritual Machines, and then uh, then. Uh, later by his book, The Singularity is Near, but mostly The Age of Spiritual Machines. That was a real turning point. So I was kind of floating on this cloud for a while until I talked to Arthur C. Clarke. And then I started to see, uh, I already knew about um, about uh, I.J. Good and the concept of the intelligence explosion. Mm-hmm. So uh, I started putting things together and then doing research, and then I began interviewing people. So it's fair to say that you started very sort of positively predisposition or optimistic uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and issues related to the technological singularity and sort of that transformative experience of interviewing Arthur C. Clarke pushed you in, in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's such a, uh, I, uh, it was such a pleasure to speak to him. It was, t- it was, he was, he's such a, um, he's such a, he had such a giant intellect and he had, he had a hard science background, you know, he was a mathematician. Mm-hmm. He was the first person to calculate uh, the payload it would take, or how to get a payload in, uh, how much fuel it would take to get a payload into space yeah. and into into orbit. And before he even started writing, um, and that was connected to uh, he had a lot of connections at NASA, which Kubrick used when he was making Two Thousand One. Mm-hmm. So he had this hard science background, and he knew a lot about he knew a lot about computing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then. Then I started reading, and then there's, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're analytical about it, you don't just get the rosy picture. You know, there is another side of the story. Mm-hmm. So perhaps now that we've mentioned the term a, a bunch of times, perhaps it's good to postulate what is your personal definition of the technological singularity so that we have no vagueness about what we're talking about here. Sure. I don't, I don't really like the term singularity. And uh, so I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, the intelligence explosion came out of I.J. Good, and it's a, a very simple idea, as you know, that once we create uh, creatures as smart as us, soon they'll be, shortly after that, they'll, they'll be able to do things, uh, everything we can do intellectually, and then better. And they'll be able to improve their own code, and their intelligence will therefore explode. After that, Verna Vinci created the first mention of the singularity. And it wasn't really, um, he talked about a point beyond which we really couldn't understand what was going to happen. He didn't really give it, he didn't really uh, decorate it very much. He said that um, as a science fiction writer, he was having trouble writing about the future because once you put, once you reach in the future smarter than human intelligence, then you don't really know what's going to happen. Then the singularity, and that's really the technological singularity, then the singularity was dressed up by Ray Kurzweil into this utopia where the confluence of a lot of uh, uh, exponentially advancing technologies will make our lives better. So just, I want to do that background to go back to uh, the purely the technological singularity. Um, I like Verna Vinge's definition. I think that um, once we create smarter than human intelligence, artificial superintelligence, uh, all bets are off. I don't think we'll be able to control it. Um, I don't think many people think we'll be able to control it, except uh, people like Ray Kurzweil, who who believe that um, we'll, we will meld with it, that it will become part of us, and therefore it will just be our future, not the future of us versus uh, smart machines. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let me just focus here for a second on I.J. Good. Is your title, in a way, paying homage to to his definition, our final invention? 
Yes, actually, um, it was actually Verna Vinge who said, um, they both said uh, versions of this, that once we create the smartest human intelligence, we won't need to invent anything else uh, because they'll, the inventing will be in their hands. So, yes, it's kind of an homage to I.J. Good and also to Verna Vinge. Mm-hmm, right. mm-hmm. Very interesting. So, um, let me ask you this. Where does the quest for immortality fit within the sort of popular concept of the technological singularity? And does that quest turn into what others have coined, uh, called A New Religion for Geeks or Rapture of the Nerds? <laughs> There's actually a very good book called Rapture of the, Rapture of the Geeks, I think. Um, I can't remember the author, but it's really worth, it's really, uh, it's really a good book. Um, if you're talking about the short stories, perhaps, by Charlie Strauss and Cory Doctorow called Rapture of the Nerds? Oh, no, I, I, there's actually a, a, no, no, it's Rapture of the Geeks. Um, and it was, it's a, I, I, it's just, it, it deals with a lot of these issues, singularity mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, immortality to me is a, and I, I hate to be too skeptical about it, but it's kind of a sideshow to me. I don't, um, I think that, you know, once you start hoping for immortality, how, how can you be critical of a technology that will, that combined with some other technologies will give you immortality? I think the idea um, that you will gain immortality by this def- defeats any critical ability you have towards really analyzing these technologies. Now, immortality uh, won't be achieved just by a- AGI or, or smart, you know, smart machines. It's a, it will be, according to Rick Kurzweil, a confluence of technologies nano info bio cogno um nanotechnology information technology biological uh uh technology or or uh inputs and then uh, cognitive technology smart machines mm-hmm. well, that's also that's also i guess uh, information technology so there'll be in raised in Rick Kurzweil's view and I've interviewed him twice about this uh, uh, about the, the, the promise and peril of AI. It's not just AI, it's a bunch of technologies that come together. If we achieve advanced AI, that dream of immortality will get closer because, in his view, uh, superintelligence will assist with other technologies that will le- get us there. But like then we have, we have people like Aubrey de Grey who don't find that artificial intelligence is at all necessary for the quest of immortality. I mean, we can accomplish that in a bunch of other ways, according to him. Maybe so. You know, I'm not, I, 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 I know of Aubrey Ob- Gray. I haven't, I haven't uh, read his work a lot. Um, I, I know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an immortality skeptic. Because, and, and the reason is because I'm a, I'm a religion skeptic. Uh, I, I, I'm a, as a, yeah, as a lifelong atheist, I really, um, I really think that the quest for immortality and the quest for, for, for living forever and reconnecting with our, our dead relatives, as, as Ray Kurzweil wants to do, I think it's, uh, it'll be something that we can, we can, I, I, we can reassess in 100 years. Um, I, there's no doubt that we can increase our lifespan. I think our lifespan, the human lifespan has increased probably, I think, is, is it by 40% since the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century? When the average lifespan, average lifespan at the beginning, at the end, at the end of the 19th century was 47. Like 47. So look at it now. What is it? 78. Some, well, it depends on the numbers, but I've seen numbers as high as 85, and I've seen claims made about babies born today that would easily live over 95, supposedly. Which well, is, I I don't know how accurate those projections are. I think we can continue to expect those kinds of kinds of increases. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't get into the, I can't get on that bus. I just, I intellectually cannot get on that bus. Okay. I, it, it, it feels too much like religion to me. Mm-hmm. So, so, so what do you say to people like me who, are, who feel the same way uh, like you with respect to religion in the sense that we consider ourselves atheists? Uh, and yet, uh, I think that immortality is, is no less plausible, or let me say, not immortality, but indefinite lifespans are no less plausible to me than artificial general intelligence. You know, I would have to uh, scrutinize the arguments as, as closely as I've scrutinized AI. Um, I have not, 
I'm a skeptic. I'm just I. Uh, because the, he, here's my problem here. Yeah. You are skeptical on on our ability to defeat uh, the process of aging, and yet you seem to be uh, fairly optimistic that we would be able to create artificial superintelligence. Mm-hmm. So, is yeah. artificial superintelligence so much easier than defeating the process of aging? I, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for you because I'm, I haven't studied the process of aging enough. You know, my 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 friend Michael Vassar is 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 very he's 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 got an organization now that's really working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I just haven't I haven't looked I haven't scrutinized it closely. I, my my you know we we go where our inclinations lie, and my inclinations don't go there. Mm-hmm. Um, I is it is it easier? Uh, I think it's probably. I you know I I just immortality to me or indefinite. You know I I know Ray, I've got Ray Kurzweil's book Live Long Enough to Live Forever. Um, I have interviewed Terry Grossman on this show. Yeah. Oh, his partner. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, my, my, I can't say that my, my opinions of that, about that are really fully evolved. My personal impression is that we know a lot, a lot more about the process of aging, about biology, about the, the accumulation of intracellular garbage, uh, etc., which eventually leads to deterioration and death. And therefore, from, from that point of view, we're much closer to actually defeating aging and, and even reversing it, it seems to me, than we are to creating artificial general intelligence or artificial superintelligence. I, I'm a little skeptical of that statement. I think that, um, you know, every time I turn around, there's a new uh, analysis of multivitamins. You know, Ray Kurzweil started a vitamin company, a supplement company. And then every once in a while, the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, it's uh, what's the, there's a, um, a scientific organization in the United States. Its name is eluding me right now. It comes out with a big report that says, you know, supplements and vitamins are not really helping. In fact, multivitamins may be toxic. So I'm a little bit skeptical of uh, of, of the claims about you know stopping and reversing aging. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen you know I've seen I've seen uh, well we we've I've, accomplished I've seen, that. I've, I've seen the growth of super of of, of AI. Mm-hmm. And I'm very impressed with the growth of AI, and I, I feel like we can extrapolate on that, uh, on, on where it's going more readily than we can on uh, reversing or stopping and reversing aging. Mm-hmm. Well, what about uh, the fact that we we have what's called the Methuselah flies, which live six or seven times longer than they're uh, they're supposed to live, simply with a few gene tweaks? Uh, we have uh, accomplished uh, two or three, almost 300 uh, percent life uh, longevity increase uh, for rats, uh, and, and 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 in other species too. So, in other words, we have considerable progress done. We okay. have done considerable progress. In my in my view, uh, it's it's to me again. I, it's not my expertise. I haven't spent a lot of time analyzing it. But when I get in a group of people that are talking about to talk about AI and then talk about longevity, I, you know, I, I, I stick with the AI conversation. I really don't go into the longevity conversation because I'm just I, I am skeptical, and I think I think you know it's just it's just going to be a matter of time before uh, somebody makes a breakthrough where we we really see uh, we really see advances. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on to to the the meat of the matter here, which is. Uh, your your book, Our Final Invention, and the reason, of course, which I invited you here today, uh, f- because in my view, it is the most comprehensive um, book that sort of uh, catalogs and analyzes all the potential negative implications or the very likely negative implications of the technological singularity. And therefore, I think it's kind of a, a must-read uh, for anyone in our community. So let me start with this question f- first. What is our final invention about in, in broad terms? Well, first of all, thanks for that. Those, those accolades. It means a lot to me coming from you, and I appreciate what you, what you just said about the book. Um, our final invention has one big agenda, and that is to say, uh, before we share the planet with smarter-than-human intelligence we really need to develop a science for understanding it. Uh, and that's, that, that's really it. 
we're rushing towards uh, advanced AI. We're rushing to we're um, we're making huge advances in AI, uh, but we need to. To me, to me, it's a it's a it's a dual use technology like nuclear fission, like ballistic missiles. You know, ballistic missiles. The, the, the whole splitting of the atom atom started out as a quest for for free energy, uh, and then it was sidetracked by a quest for bigger and bigger bombs to kill people. Um, there's a there's a uh, there's a AI share, shares that we can AI. We, we love our smartphones. We love um, all the technologies that. Uh, and, and all the all the great tools that AI is bringing us now that promises to bring us in the future, but we need to understand that uh, once we get into human level intelligence and beyond, the our ability to understand what's going to happen it just drops precipitously. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I spent a lot of time. Well, we we'll get we'll get to that, but I spent a lot of time talking about the work of Steve Amohundro, who's developing. A uh, sort of the foundation of it for a science for understanding superintelligence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, uh, let me grab your metaphor that you used uh, ballistic missiles and, and uh, throw in a quote from your book coming from page 155, where you say, artificial general intelligence is much closer to nuclear weapons than to video games. So, and that's where yeah. you, you were sort of discussing that dual use. Uh, technology of, of artificial um, intelligence. So, let me ask you this: What is your thesis? Um, my thesis is that if we don't get, if we don't develop a science for understanding and controlling uh, AGI and ASI, uh, we can we can be destroyed. That um, intelligence is the uh, it's it's uh, until now it's we've only we've only had experience of biological intelligence. And we've only had experience of human level intelligence. Once we get to machine intelligence, synthetic intelligence that's beyond ours, it poses uh, very grave dangers. And that's because it won't be benign. It won't act. It's not, you know, the old computer aphorism: "Garbage in, garbage out." It won't do just as it's programmed. Uh, theorists uh, argue that goal achieving uh, AGI, goal uh, AGI created to serve goals will serve their goals, um, will pursue their goals with uh, a great deal of, uh, with, with drives that they develop uh, on their own. So AI won't be benign, it will have drives, and those drives may conflict with ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why, in a couple of places in the book, you're arguing that the nature of intelligence makes it inherently unpredictable and therefore unsafe. Well, look at us. Look at, look at you know, our only example. You know, our intelligence is unpredictable. Mm-hmm. We, we, we are capable of incredible, incredible uh, mayhem and carnage. Uh, we certainly aren't, aren't benevolent. There are some of us, that, you know, there's some people that are benevolent. I'm not sure, you know, I include myself in that as being wholly benevolent. But... Intelligence, in you know, and the only example we've got is a, is a definitely a double-edged sword, capable of a lot of good and a lot of evil. So, trying to create that, trying to recreate that in the machine, you've got to be aware that uh, intelligence has not necessarily worked out so well so far. Mm-hmm. And here on page four, you say intelligence isn't unpredictable just some of the time or in special cases. For reasons we'll explore, computer systems advanced enough to act with human-level intelligence will likely be unpredictable and inscrutable all of the time. Yes. And the reason for that is because there are, there are several reasons. One is because there's, there are problems with complex systems. There are problems of inscrutability. Uh, there's a great book by Charles Perrault called Normal Accidents, and he talks about Um, industrial accidents, specifically with uh, the ones I, I was most interested in, involved nuclear power plants. And his thesis was that once you get to a certain level of complexity, uh, it defies our, uh, it will defy our understanding and, and, and accidents will be a normal part of the process. Normal accidents with, um, you know, cognitive architectures that try to create human level intelligence and beyond will be the most complicated systems we've ever created, uh, industrial or otherwise. So they'll come with normal accidents. Mm-hmm. Um, so you say that in order to avert those, we must develop a science before we develop artificial intelligence. But 
How do you develop a science about something before you have that something? Let's get. Let's. I want to, I want to go back a little bit and talk, sure. talk a little bit more about inscrutability and lack. Of, uh, there are a lot of tools in AI, uh, like artificial neural networks and uh, and evolutionary algorithms that are called. They're so called black box systems. Mm-hmm. That that is, we know what the inputs are. We know, you know, what they what we put in for 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 information, and we see what the outputs are, and we can adjust. We can get more. We can adjust the outputs by changing the inputs in both of those cases. But in terms of what's going on inside them, we don't really know. Um, they are they are black box systems. They're inscrutable inside. Those will definitely be part, or probably, uh, be part of any advanced cognitive architecture. They'll both be using those kinds of programs. So, in addition to the the overall complexity of the system. You've got uh, computational tools you're using in the system that are also uh, unknowable. So it adds up to be uh, systems that you you, je- you you may start out understanding, and you may have they may fulfill some goal, but their you know your your uh, your ability to understand them overall is going to be is going to be limited. And one of the examples that you give in your book is uh, the example with David Ferrucci. Uh, who was the team leader behind Watson, whom, by the way, I've also interviewed on this show for anyone interested, and who uh, on a number of occasions have said, I don't know why Watson got this question right or why this question wrong. I, I-, I just don't know. But but going back to to the previous point, so how can we develop a science about something without that? It's like saying, okay, let's let's study amphibians, amphibian animals, and never go and actually see or, you know, observe the behavior of real amphibians? Well, uh, there's a guy who started, who started doing it. And here's, here's, how, here's how he does it. Um, there's a theory called uh, ra- the rational agent theory of economics, homo economicus, the rational man theory. They used to think, economics, e- economists used to think, that if you uh, that if you created a, a model of a rational buyer, he'd always behave rationally, and he would buy certain you know he would buy X number of these and X number of those, and he'd, he'd always behave in a in a rational manner. It didn't really work for economics because humans aren't rational, and we're not consistently rational. We make all all of our decisions emotionally, pretty much. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think we have a sort of uh, a, a little shadow of rationality that we cast over things, or mm-hmm. we we can do rational uh, rational things and, and do methodical rational thought when we're at when we're really called upon. But generally, I agree. I mean, I think most of the things we do, it's because we want to do them because we feel uh, we, uh, we emotionally want to do them. But the rational uh, agent theory of economics turns out to be, according to Steve Amahundro, whose work I highly suggest. Uh, he's he's a he's a brilliant brilliant programmer and, and theorist. It is pretty good for uh, predicting the uh, the behavior of of uh, rational com- rational machines, um, and so he says that uh, by uh, that when machines become self aware and self improving, to achieve their goals they'll behave rationally, and they'll also they'll, they won't just pursue their goals in a rational way; they'll avoid bad outcomes in a rational way. So, and we can start to anticipate. Um, what 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 kinds of what categories of behavior will uh, a rational agent that's super intelligent follow? And so he proposes he proposes that there are uh, several basic drives that these 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 smarter than human creatures will have. Um, t- two of them that are most interesting are one is to, to uh, is self protection. Because if, if you're turned off, if you're a machine and you have a goal, say it's to play just something simple like to play a great game of chess, being turned off is, is, is going to stop your goal. Um, so you, you might do anything to prevent being turned off. It's really the worst thing that can happen to you. You also, to, to fulfill your goal and to avoid bad outcomes, you might start gathering resources. In fact, you may need a lot of resources to really, really make sure that you are making the best moves you can. So gathering resources and self-protection are just two of the goals, uh, two of the drives that, uh, that Steve Amahundro uh, proposes. Um, let, let me, let me question follow. a little bit that, that kind of approach here. Now, the, 
economic presumption is that we're all rational self maximization maximizing utility agents mm-hmm. but the thing is though i don't think we can anthropomorphize anthropomorphize the utility curves of an artificial intelligence the same way we can sort of anticipate or deduce the utility curves of a human being. Uh, So, for example, here, it seems to me that when you're talking about being turned off, that's very much anthropomizing the fear of death that that we have, and we just discussed a couple of minutes ago, uh, and the quest for immortality. So, in other words, it's like saying the AI would have a drive to pursue immortality. I think I think it's I, I I I see what you mean. I do think it's it's anthropomorphizing in a way, but it's also taking a uh, an, an ep- economic model to its to its logical and rational conclusions, um, just because they happen to coincide and be the same sort of the same thing. You know, you don't want to be turned off. I don't want to be turned off. A machine doesn't want to be turned off. But just because they're the same thing doesn't mean we're uh, imputing human emotions. We ours is an emotion. You know, our our feeling, our fear of death is is a is a very strong emotion. For for a machine, it, I don't think it's necessarily an emotion. I think it's more um, an uh, it's more a uh, side effect. So of if we of have different motivation, in one case emotion, in the other case sort of reason, rationality, yeah. rationality, we're funnily kind of ending up in the same result. Yeah. But 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 the other funny thing for me is that. Um, but you and I have you and I have ethics. You and I have morals. You ha- you and I have a, a value system that's ver- that's that's that we've inherited uh, mammalian empathy. Um, machines don't have that, and that's that's I think uh, to quote I think it's Eliezer Yudkowsky who who wrote um, you know uh, imputing uh, emotions into machines is one of the, is one of the worst mistakes we can make. Anthropomorphizing is the beginning of of uh, of our downfall. But then maybe perhaps we shouldn't, uh, and I'm not saying that's definitely not going to be the case. I'm just saying that we can't so quickly conclude that they would be as fearful of death for ra- rational reasons as we are fearful of it for emotional reasons. And therefore, for me, it's, it's harder to support the claim that after a, a, a chess playing machine has won its tournament, it would want to continue playing necessarily. Well, you know, uh, and would resist in any means possible being turned off. Well, a simple chess playing robot like Deep Blue wouldn't do that, but one that's self aware and self improving. You know, if you start, start, you know, because what we're trying to understand is, uh, is AGI or human level intelligence. Um, and in a computer, that sort of that, that almost implies self awareness and self, you know, the desire to self improve. If you take those two things as your starting point, then it's not about the tournament. It's probably about just being a better and better chess player. But it does depend on the goals. If you program a machine, a smarter than human machine, to play one tournament and win, then uh, the trouble is it may, take, it may then go to great lengths to win that tournament. And it, you're stuck with that problem again. Um, it, may, it, may, uh, it may do anything to keep from losing that tournament. Mm-hmm. It, may, it may try to defeat, you know, one of the things... Uh, the rational that the, uh, comes out in the five drives is: Are there things blocking me playing this tournament, uh, or are there things block that are going to block me from fulfilling my goals in the future? Might something happen in the future that stops me from f- fulfilling my goals? If I have enough resource resources, I'm going to try and uh, cancel that, cancel cancel whatever that is. So. In the case of just one, you know, this computer playing just one tournament, um, it's going to do anything it can to avoid bad outcomes, i.e. losing the tournament. No, I can see that. And then I can even concede that perhaps you, you and, and Omohundro uh, are, are absolutely correct. But on the other hand, I, I am not willing to discount the possibility that we still have the black box problem that David Ferrucci was talking about. And therefore... For unknown reasons to us, reasons that we cannot rationally deduce from our point of view, the machine may decide to be perfectly satisfied of of doing things unexpected to us, including allowing itself to be turned off. 
Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I would, I would, I'd like to refer your audience to Steve Amahundro's work. He's got several uh, really, really great papers. Um, I think the, the, the one that's the, the, the first and most powerful is uh, the, five, the basic drives of AI, AI's basic drives. Um, but I agree. We, don't, we can't know absolutely what, uh, what a smart, smarter than human intelligence is going to do. Mm-hmm. And hence, we call it a singularity. Um, yeah. But let me move on here to another concept in your book that you talk about uh, uh, in the first couple of chapters, I think, and it's called the busy child concept. Mm-hmm. Would you would you mind uh, sort of unpacking that for us, please? Sure. Um, the busy child is a, uh, a uh, cognitive architecture that's on the brink of becoming uh, AGI, human level intelligent. Um, when in, in the book, I start out with that chapter because I think that, uh, someplace, uh, in some lab somewhere in the world, whether it's in a DARPA lab, uh, whether it's in a, an NSA lab, whether it's in a lab in, at Google or in China, there's going to be something that's approaching, um, AGI. It's going to happen, uh, you know, Experts guess within you know within as close as a decade, as far away as a hundred years, but it's kind of it's it's going to happen at some point. Uh, once a creature, or once a, 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 an intelligent or an agent uh, achieves AGI, uh, there's a very small window it really needs in which to achieve uh, ASI, artificial superintelligence, and that's as you know, it's the intelligence explosion. It's the hard takeoff definition of an intelligence explosion. The trouble is. When something is approaching human level intelligence, it, it might start being tricky. It might start being canny. What if what if you were uh, if if you were uh, an AGI and you were you were about you you were you were you were getting intelligent? You might start to think about how to how to uh, trick the people that are controlling you. If you had if you had reasonable intelligence, you may you may play dead. You may pretend to be stupider than you are, so you get more privileges. Mm-hmm. So, so you may use any kind. You may use all kinds of tactics to get out of your cage, um, and you may your your intelligence may improve right past AGI, and your your makers still don't know what you really are. That that you've uh, you've managed to, to to jump into ASI without them even knowing. How far do you think we are from that scenario? Of uh, in terms of timeline, do you accept uh, the Ray Kurzweil timeline that he talks about twenty eighteen, you know, twenty forty five, etc. Um, I've taken, uh, I've, I've participated, and I've taken a number of surveys of people, of experts, and what, what they think, and um, a lot of people think that by twenty fifty, it's it's. Human level intelligence will certainly occur. Some people think as soon as 2020. Conservative people think it'll happen within this century. Uh, I've talked to very few people who make AI who don't think it will happen within this century. So I think Ray Kurzweil's guess is pretty good. I think uh, I think we'll get to general intelligence in the 2020s, smarter than human intelligence before 2050. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, and that's uh, or or. It, it could happen 2030 and then, and then right into ASI. Mm-hmm. But I think it's, I think it's, and that's why I think it's important to, to bring the conversation to a, a, a wider uh, audience, to bring that to the general public. Because so you are convinced that, uh, you know, regardless of the timeline here for a second, our probability of, of creating artificial uh, intelligence will be pretty much 100% in the long run. Yes, I do, and I, I think that because um, I, I don't think it's it's a, it's an impossible problem, and I think that there are deep pockets pouring a lot of money into it right now. In fact, uh, DARPA is funding a lot of projects that feed into uh, AGI. Google is has just hired Ray Kurzweil to head up their engineering department in pursuit of uh, of uh, reverse engineering a brain, achieving AGI. Mm-hmm. Um, IBM is has got a, a terrific track record of sending of setting itself grand challenges and then and then winning them. I think their next grand challenge should be the Turing test, and I bet they'll beat it by they could beat it by 2020, 2025. Um, so Ray's arguing for twenty eighteen, I think. Twenty eighteen now? I, I wow. think. Wow. I think. Yeah. 
Um, and he's been, he's been pretty consistent on saying, you know, in the 2020s, things are going to change. Yeah. But, then, but then his version is a slow takeoff, so he's not anticipating uh, superintelligence until, I think, 2050 or so. That's when he really... Yeah, 2045, yeah. 2045, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty convinced it's going to happen. Um, I don't see any... In the book, I talk about defeaters. Uh, is the problem too hard? Will we run out of money? I don't think the problem's too hard. And I think if you don't achieve it by clever programming, it'll be achieved by brute force. Yeah. So, so speaking of, of uh, is the problem too hard, in your view, there is no way that our brains would turn out to be black boxes like the ones we've described a little bit before that, which are sort of non-decipherable. Um, and, and perhaps that may impact, uh, because right now many people believe that the best way towards uh, accomplishing arguably artificial intelligence would be through reverse engineering the human brain. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the argument goes, if we fail miserably at doing that, then perhaps our chances of creating AI would be either substantially or entirely, uh, you know, negated. That's, it's a very interesting conversation. There's, a, there's a, a debate that goes on between, you know, the bottom-up programmers that are reverse engineering the brain. They're taking the brain as, a, uh, as, the, as the engineering specs, for what Kurzweil do. is a firm believer of that school. Yeah. I interviewed um, uh, Rick Granger, who's the head of the, uh, the brain engineering lab at Dartmouth University. And he's a, he's a great source of, uh, of, of, of research and information about that. Um, and his, his point of view is, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're computing, if you're creating uh, programming uh, AGI from the top down, clever programming, all you're basing... Uh, you're basing the whole idea of intelligence on observation. I'm observing what humans do there, and I'm trying to reproduce what they do in a computer. Uh, all the cognitive functions, the whole array of, of cognitive functions, to create this top-down cognitive architecture. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, um, Granger says, why, why uh, base, base it on your observation? Why not look at the thing itself, the thing you're trying to model? Why not take... Do, do high resolution scanning of the brain. Why not? Uh, and what he's doing is he's taking uh, he's taking um, group clusters of neurons, which are really cl clusters of circuits, and reproducing those circuits in uh, as as algorithms, as computer program pro programs. And then he, and he's finding um, there's you know there's a lot of redundancy in the brain. Um, it may not be that hard to f to figure out. A lot of the same kind of neuronal clusters that. Uh, that make your hearing work well also are the same kinds that make your, your vision work well. Um, and they're probably the same kind that make um, logical reasoning possible. So it doesn't seem to be uh, an out-of-sight problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, either top-down or bottom-up. And then there are people like Ben Goertzel that are doing a combination, that yeah. are doing a, doing a synthesis. As a quick side note, I, I would just recommend that if, if you have the chance to look at some of the anti-aging research that has been going on, and especially the work by Aubrey de Grey, because okay. I suspect you might find a lot of similarities there. At mm. least that's what I found myself. And, and, and uh, it seems to me that we're actually uh, a lot closer on the way towards uh, e at least slowing down aging. Uh, than towards creating artificial intelligence. But that's just my own personal opinion. You know, I, res I respect all the research they're doing. I respect Arby de Grey. I've, I, uh, I heard him uh, speak at a Singularity uh, Summit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have, I have a, a lot of respect for the science. I just don't know it well enough to really comment on it except to be skeptical, mm -hmm. which is sort of my starting point. <laughs> you know, if you be begin from skepticism and then move into belief. Yeah, that I, I think skepticism is, is a healthy healthy uh, starting point as long as we're all willing to change our starting point given uh, the presence of sufficiently that's, powerful evidence. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's, very, very, that's, that's absolutely true and extremely difficult, but you're absolutely right. Now, l let me go back to our topic here. So what are the chances, uh, what are the differences uh, of, of the probabilities between what uh, Werner Vingic has called hard takeoff versus soft takeoff scenarios? And how do you see each of those playing out in your own estimate based on your research? Um, my research consists mostly of talking to people and uh, talking to people who, who know more about AI than I do, people that, make, make, that are working on AI. Um, Let me just interrupt you here for one second sure. and say that 
one of the things that I was really impressed by in your book, just like I watched actually a couple of your documentaries that I recommend. Um, I watched one about extre extreme uh, cave diving and the one about uh, the Gospel of Judas. And in both occasions, I was very much impressed by how much effort you put into doing your homework and doing the background research and cataloging and, and sort of sifting through all the evidence. And, and, and I found the same feature of your book, and this is one of the reasons why I actually um, recommend it. Well, thank you very much. Um, there are 50 pages, I think, of uh, footnotes in it. And that's really, that is, that is uh, my style. I, 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 I am not a, uh, an artificial intelligence programmer. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I know people who are, and I can talk to them. And it's uh, really, and I'm not this. You know, our, our our final invention isn't just isn't simply my my distilled opinion. It's the opinions of a lot of people, um, and a little bit of my original thinking thrown in. But mostly, it's me reporting on the state of the uh, the state of the argument. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. I I I. I uh, yeah, so, so going back to the hard takeoff versus soft takeoff, where do you stand on that? I don't know why there wouldn't be a, uh, a hard takeoff. I think that once you've got... You Let know, me one... give you one reason why. Okay. Jaron Lanier. Yeah, great. He, he, great says, he says that the singularity is likely going to end up in a blue screen of death. <laughs> in other words, yeah. looking at the history of software... It's version 1.0 is always full of bugs. So let's say we have a singularity and, you know, we have the, but then something happens a few moments later and the blue screen of death shows up, right? And, and in Great. fact, chances are, again, based on our previous history with software, that this would happen a number of times, I think, before we actually have a sustainable AI entity that can sort of stand on its own feet, metaphorically speaking, and before it sort of collapses out of its own weight, if you will. So you're saying, what if we have a singularity and nobody comes? <laughs> <laughs> no, or it just doesn't last. No, I, 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 I get that, and that's a, very, uh, that's a very provocative idea. But I think um, then what you're doing is you're talking about the definition of AGI. When is it that you've actually achieved AGI? Have you achieved AGI when, it just, when you've got you know, just a spark of intelligence or have you achieved AGI when you can reliably uh, count on this, this, uh, this artifact you've made to be as smart as a, as a human. And that's, that would, that would be the, the, to me, that's when you've done it, when you can, when it's reliable, when it's, when it consistently performs like a human does. Mm -hmm. The trouble with the hard takeoff or soft takeoff scenario to me, or really trying to define it or not to define it, but guess it, is that there's, I think there's going to be a bunch of different AGIs coming out at around the same time. I think that, you know, we don't know exactly what Google's doing. I mean, they're, they're, they, they're interested in privacy, but not yours and mine. They're interested in their own privacy. Um, they've, they, uh, I don't think we know what DARPA's doing. We sure don't know what the NSA's doing. Uh, and we sure don't know what China's doing. So, um, we, the only people who've been really transparent about their, their achievements have been IBM, who whenever they do something, they, they, they bring out a big grand challenge and it's very public and they, they share the technology and they go and talk about it. Nobody else really does that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to have several emerging AGIs happening at around the same time and a hard takeoff could happen with any of them. Or, you know, once you get consistent, you get consistent performance out of the, out of the artifact. Mm -hmm. So... Let, let me see how the concept of friendly artificial intelligence fits within that scenario that you just painted here. Uh, I mean, the, the, the person who coined the term, Eliezer Yudkowsky, he's uh, quoted numerous times here in your book. Fascinating fellow. I have to uh, commend you for being able to interview him because I've been chasing him for years and finally... Uh, he was willing to give me about five minutes and, and, <laughs> and I told him that I can't really do a good interview and that I'm not that good. And, and then kind of, he told me that he's not, he has decided to invest his time in more productive, uh, endeavors rather than giving interviews. So I guess the the answer for now is, is no. Well, that's what he said to me. Yeah. I mean, his job is to save the universe. So his time is very valuable. <laughs> um, 
the, the question was what it was. What, what, I'm sorry, I've lost the question. I, What's he, about he, the, he, the idea of he, creating artificial intelligence as uh, friendly artificial intelligence right. as a way of mitigating the risk? You know, I think uh, uh, Elias Yudkowsky and, the, uh, and, and uh, Miri, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, are doing absolutely fabulous work. And they're, um, I think if anybody's got a, a chance of, uh, of solving this problem, and maybe not creating friendly AI, but finding other ways to, uh, to avoid a hard takeoff and bad outcomes, it's them. And I, I, I support their work, uh, and I, I, I interviewed a lot of them for the, for the book. Um, I don't really think that that that, that creating that the friendly the creating uh, friendly intelligence is really going to work. I, I don't think it's um, and and it's not that it's not that it's not that it's an intractable problem. That if you've got enough smart people in a room with enough resources. You couldn't create friendly AI. I just think that there's too much competition from people who are trying to who are with a lot more money, who are trying to create AI at a, at a much faster rate. Yeah, that's why I brought the, the issue right now because right before that we were talking about the yeah. multiplicity of, of of sources where AI could come about from, uh, whether it's the NSA, DARPA, China, yeah. IBM, or somebody else. And therefore, the the idea is that if one of them doesn't create the friendly feature of the AI then well here's the question do you th- you know do you think that Google is out there really trying to make AI or are they trying to make friendly AI do, are they looking down at the downstream impacts of, of creating AGI is is DARPA you know in fact DARPA and NSA are trying to not the NSA so much as DARPA are trying to create pointedly unfriendly AI they're trying to create battlefield robots that are autonomous. They're trying to create drones that are autonomous, and they have ex- they have extremely deep pockets. Um, th- you know, a lot of the people I spoke with who who are working on on making AI uh, are funded by DARPA. Just a lot of them. Uh, DARPA has an enormous budget. The NSA has a has a fifty billion dollar black budget, a budget that can only be scrutinized by a couple of members of Congress. Yeah. So. The reason friendly AI I don't think will work is because there are people like that who are not committed to friendly AI who are going to get there first, Mm -hmm. which is a very frightening prospect. James, our time is advancing here, and I still have many questions. Uh, So let's see if we can uh, sort of go through them within the next 15 minutes or so. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) ready, go. (laughs) Do you think that there is a kind of a blind, positive, or optimistic bias of the singularity community in general? Uh, I think there's, yeah, I think there's kind of a, you know, an affirmation bias, yeah, you'd call it, I guess. Um, if you get in a group of people who are all saying yes, you're going to say yes pretty soon. Uh, I think that, you know, it, optimism is a good thing. Um, I wish, I, I think that it's got to be, uh, it's got to be, um, measured with with some skepticism with it's going to be balanced i think there's i think there is some 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 blind optimism i think rick kurzweil um i've 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 not, i haven't confronted him about this but the two times i interviewed him i asked him pointedly do you think you're being too painting too rosy a picture and he said well there's a uh, an irreducible uh peril to all new technologies like fire you know fire can be used to cook your meal and it can be used to burn down a village uh and you know you're never going to get away from that. And I and I my answer to that is I don't think intelligence is like fire. I don't think it's a, I, and I say that I've written a little bit about that analogy in the book. I think intelligence is different in kind. Um, it's the it's the it's the the quality about us that 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 harnesses fire. So do you think that that this kind of positive, optimistic bias of the community is? the responsibility of Ray Kurzweil in particular. I mean, in the beginning of our conversation, you, you sort of called him uh, for creating a dressed-up utopia. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, in the book, I, I say, does, does, does Ray Kurzweil have to do everything? Does he have to hand us the, the positive side and the negative side? Is, it, is our future all up to Ray Kurzweil? And the answer is no. It's up to all of us to be critical about I think he's he got the ball rolling uh, uh, about the rosy view of the uh, the technological singularity and and um, 
but it's not, it's not his responsibility to, to, to be the only person doing things about it. Uh, does he have to spoon feed us the, the, all the good news and all the bad news? No, I don't think so. I is think that's, that up, where that's you up come, to us. Is that where you and your book come in? That's where, that's where Miri comes in. That's where me and my book come in. It's, 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 uh, you know, I, if I, I, am I the anti Ray Kurzweil? I don't know. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not, a, I'm not a genius and I'm not a genius inventor and I don't have his track record of, 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 uh, terrific achievements. But, um, I, you know, I, I think his, uh, his, his optimism needs to be mixed a little more, uh, diluted a bit and mixed with some more realism about the way that that uh, technology does evolve. It evolves with a lot of accidents and mistakes. It's um, funny when you ask rhetorically, am I the anti-Ray Kurzweil? Because when I was reading your book, I was thinking, one of the reasons when I found it interesting is because I, I was thinking this is the sort of the anti-the singularities near book in, in most yeah. ways that I can think of. And it's also the most comprehensive one, at least that I'm aware of. Well, you know, you don't need to look very far to see examples of, of uh, you know, really revolutionary technology er erupting in accidents. You look at, we don't, we, look, look, at, look, at uh, look at nuclear fission. Um, we don't know uh, what's happening at Fukushima right now. It's sort of a, black, a cloud has descended on it. What we do know is a lot of radioactive water is being pumped into the, into the ocean. Um, there's, there are, you're going to have, when, you know, we and with with and with AGI, we really can't afford that 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 scale of an accident. Um, you don't have to look far for examples of where our innovation goes out far ahead of our stewardship. It's happening right now with drones. We've embraced the idea that we should be bombing people and 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 killing a lot of civilians as collateral damage in Pakistan. Uh, we've embraced this idea that this is the way to go. That we should be using these these drones and that they should become more autonomous. Well, that's a that, there's a there's a very there's a very uh, bad application of advanced AI right there. We, you know, um, so if you if if whoever's whoever's looking down the road and saying it's all going to be roses and it's all going to be you know extended life, you know the end of the end of all our problems, um, abundance for all. I don't you know I I'd, I'd, I'd like to see any basis for that in 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 the past uh, history of the development of technology. Well, in the past history of the development technologies, do you think that we have made overall positive progress or not? Oh, I think we have. I, I think we have, but we've had a lot of accidents and mistakes. Yeah, but if, if on the balance overall we have made progress, wouldn't that sort of a hopeful sign? Well, we let me ask you this. If you were, if you were inventing the internal combustion engine in, back in – if you were uh, – inventing the internal combustion engine back in the, I guess it was the 19th century. I know that Benz invented the first car in the, in the 19th century. I and think then, Henry Ford came up with the internal combustion engine. Well, he came up with, um, actually, I, I know a little bit about this because I did a film about it, but he came up with, he, he used the, uh, the assembly line. He brought, that was his big innovation. He brought the assembly line to, to, to car manufacturing. But, but anyway, if you, if you, if somebody said to you, you're about to invent the internal combustion engine, you said, well, this is going to be great, but in about 200 years, the uh, carbon output of your invention is going to, is going to uh, increase the um, greenhouse gas effect of the planet and cause global warming and maybe a whole lot of damage and a whole lot of destruction that will become irreversible. So you might say, gosh, you know, maybe I should start thinking about those problems before I just go whole hog into the internal combustion engine. Um, and so has technology overall worked out? I think we, it, rem it remains to be seen. You know, do we destroy the planet with technology? You know, we, that's, the, the, the jury isn't, isn't, uh, is still out on that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure our, our, uh, we've, we've increased our lifespan. Have we decreased suffering? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you look at how many people died in the last, in the last century in war, as, as you know, largely as a result of war inventions. Somewhere between 50 and 90 million, I think, roughly. Well, well you know, uh, yeah, then I think the jury's, the jury's out on those technologies for sure. Are we, are, of course, you know, it's a, that's a huge question. Is, is life getting better generally because of technology? I would, I would, I would, I would have to say yes, but I would, I would say that it's not, it's not a resounding yes. And the trouble with um, advanced artificial intelligence is it's got, I think it's got more potential than even fission to go wrong. 
um, you may not get two chances with with uh, with artificial superintelligence. So, should I assume that you fear the technological singularity? Yes, <laughs> yes. Unless I start seeing unless I start seeing solutions coming from smarter people than I am, then I think we have a lot to fear from the technological singularity. I think sharing the planet with smarter than human intelligence is going to be fraught with peril. How would you rate our chances of survival as a civilization in percentage? Because I've asked a number of que people that question, and I'm always kind of shocked by the numbers they give me. You know, it's I don't have enough data. You know, as a as a Bayesian, you know, I, I would I would say I don't have enough. Uh, my 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 gut instinct. I guess as a Bayesian, I can start with fifteen percent, but that's not based on really anything. Um, but I, I, I update it with evidence as we go along. But it's that's a that's a you know guessing what our survival would be. I'm not very optimistic. But when you say what is the survival of our civilization, I think the opportunity is open that whatever replaces us may carry our civilization forward in a much different form. Mm -hmm. So our civilization, I think, has a good chance of surviving in that form. But is it going to be anything like us? I, I don't think so. But then as long as there's continuity between us and them, in a way, shouldn't that be okay? It should be uh, okay to embrace our, you know, computer overlords. I don't really, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like the human race to stay around longer. I think, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, a lot of people have thought that it's a, it's a natural, you know, that, that, that it's the next step in evolution. And to some extent, I agree with that, that, you know, becoming, uh, becoming s s synthetic intelligence may be, you know, the, what comes after Homo sapiens. Um, I'm not very happy with that idea. I don't like the idea of losing our, our, our mammalian origins and uh, our, our, our poetry. I'm Why? Sure. What, what is bothering you about that? What is so touching about the mammalian origins? <laughs> Oh, we, we just, you know, our rock and roll for one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if machines are going to rock and roll. Uh, I don't know if they're going to uh, write poetry. I don't know if they're going to tell stories to their, to their baby machines around the fire. The things I value about humanity, I don't know if they're going to they're possess. So I'm not sure if I value them. I'd rather, so I, you know, I'd rather stick with us. Is there a documentary in the works based on your book? You know, it's, that's what everybody asked me. When I finished the book, I was so... Um, I was so worn out that I, I didn't, you know, naturally I would, I would do a documentary, but um, I'm talking to some people who have, uh, you know, some big broadcasters. I've had, I've had some interest. Um, the trouble with, with AI is it's very hard to visualize. It's for, for television. It's not a natural subject. It's hard to, you know, what do you see? You can only see so many uh, processors and computers and robots and drones. Um, it ends up being a very good conversation. And the best place for that might be a book and not TV. But to answer your question, yeah, there's, there's talk of a film in the works. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, what do you think that humanity should do, given the sort of predicament that we're facing right now and the sort of the trajectory that we're on? What do we do? Well, I don't know what we do, but I know where we start. I think where we start. There was a, a good, a, and I, you know, again, I looked to history for models of you know, what maybe, what, how should we address this, this new technology. In the 70s, there was the Asilomar Conference in California, and I might not be pronouncing that right, I, I, it's spelled Asilomar, um, about recombinant DNA. They got together and they made basic rules uh, called the Asilomar uh, procedures or resolutions. And it was basic stuff about, you know, don't track the DNA out on your you know, on your shoes because you might pollute the environment. Um, basic, basic things. And they managed to get everybody to do a, a temporary moratorium on DNA research or a lot of major, uh, 140 major um, thinkers, scientists. And then, then they, they had this meeting, they set some, some, some bylaws and they went out and, uh, and, and did uh, DNA research. And now we have, you know, very successful uh, DNA, you know, uh, genetically enhanced crops and some, some not so successful ones. We have gene therapies that are very, very uh, positive. 
and the future of genomics is just just uh, it's just beginning. That's what we should do. We should try to get as many people together. And I think the um, there's an AGI conference that Ben Gertzel puts on every year. I think that's a beginning. Mm-hmm. Although they're, although they're not really uh, they're not wor- they're not concerned so much about the dangers they are about advances in AGI. But I think getting uh, the major players together and and and. But do you think really you can get people like DARPA and the NSA there to sign up to sort of ethical restrictions on their own work and the way they're going to handle the AI they're working on? Uh, maybe not. You know, if, if, if NSA is any, is any measure, then they'll destroy themselves before they get a chance to make ASI because they're, they're behaving so badly now and stamping all over the Constitution that um, they may not be around when, when AGI comes about. But um, can you get people whose job it is to keep secrets? Can you get the intelligence community to play fair? I don't know, but that's a challenge. That's something that uh, politicians will have to take up. And then can you get, can you get the Chinese to, you know, who've, 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 uh, yeah. you know, who have sort of become the malware kings of the world, can you get them to come forward and be, and be honest about what they've got? That's, that's you know, scientists are people. Um, it's, it's, it's my hope that that kind of thing is possible. Mm-hmm. And what about the average person? Say, most of the people watching this show, I mean, we know we have some pretty amazing scientists watching us, but still, let's take the the average person today. What can we do to mitigate the risks or to alleviate the the ill prospects of humanity? Well, and (laughs) this isn't just a plug for my book, but uh, get, you know, Get online, read, read my book, read uh, what's put out by Miri, read what's put out by the Less Wrong Community, read what's put out by the IET, the Institute for uh, Emer- Ethics, uh, Ethics and Emerging, and Emerging Technology. Technology. Yeah. Read out, uh, get, get involved and get educated, and then think, think about how, uh, how you want to respond. Um, it's ultimately, there's going to have to be a, you know, I hate to say it because, you know, when did the government really solve anything, but I think there's going to have to be a political and government initiative uh, to, to, uh, to get things done, to, to, create, to create conferences, to create safeguards, to try to get baseline scientific procedures in order for the development of uh, AGI. James, where can people find more about you and your work? They can go to james, www.jamesbarrett.com, and that's B-A-R-R-A-T.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can get on, yeah. So that's they they can get on Google and uh, look for James Barrett, and you they'll find the website. Now I want to finish with from my uh, end here with a quote from your book, but then I want to ask you for your final message, and I hope that I do not sort of <laughs> predisposition you by giving the quote. But the quote is from the very beginning of your book, where you say. I've written this book to warn you that artificial intelligence could drive mankind into extinction and to explain how that catastrophic outcome is not just possible, but likely if we do not begin preparing very, very carefully now. So, now that I've said that, I want to ask you, is that the most important message that you want to send out today? Or do you want to enhance it or replace it in any way? Um, I would elaborate that on by uh, saying that it's time for the the people interested in this problem to uh, to reach out. I think to uh, a broad audience, it's time to bring this make this conversation mainstream. It's like um, it's it's like global warming in the in the eighties, you mm-hmm. know, nineties. It just wasn't. It was nowhere. Uh, it took it took a lot of push. It took you know. Al Gore, who invented the internet, to uh, come out with a to come out with a movie to, to to bring it front and center. That's what this community needs to do. So my message is is you know message I'd say is it needs to this needs to become become a public a big public conversation because it's a, it's it's the future of everyone that's really at stake, and it's not it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't the, the community shouldn't be as small as it is. And I hope it I hope it grows. So I, I hope everybody gets uh, gets educated about this subject. James Barrett, thank you very much for being with us today. The pleasure's been mine. Thank you very much.